Welcome back to the Value Investors Club. I'm your host, Timon Wunderlich. Let's get right into it with VIC readings. This is not recommendation, only for information. And we have Fever Drinks, Fever Tree Drinks, F-E-V-R-L-O-N and F-V-V-T-F-O-T-C. Uh, filed in on October 11th, 2022 by Supernova. Description. Elevator pitch. Fever Tree, Fever, is a consumer brand that essentially created its own category, premium cocktail mixers. Fever has been met with a strong demand in almost every market it has entered, driving explosive sales, sales growth and market share gains in tonic and ginger beer. Fever has already achieved a dominant of 45% market share in its home country, UK, and is now seeding the globe with its deliciousness. It has compelling financial characteristics led by strong organic growth, 5 and 10 year organic sales kager of 34% and 32% with a long runaway runway ahead. It has an asset light business model with a return on tangible capital of over 100%. They have grown free cash flow every year since IPO with no down years. They have a strong balance sheet, Fort Knox baby, <laughs> with no debt and net cash equal to 10% of their market cap. Despite their small size and high growth, they pay a dividend of 1.9% yield and even paid a sizable special divvy a few months ago. While top-line growth continues unabated, earnings have recently been hit by a sub supply chain and cost inflation issues that have driven EBITDA margins from 30% to 10%. Despite sales and other KPIs that point to a healthy brand, the margin weakness has driven the stock down, whooping 70% year-to-date. Extraordinary for a consumer stapled stock. The, the supply chain and cost inflation issues should provely, uh, prove mostly transitionary, uh, providing a window of opportunity to buy this little gem at only 10x EPS, 2024 normalized earnings X cash. Description. London-based Fever Tree Drinks is the world's largest purveyor purveyor of premium cocktail mixers. Approximately 80% of sales are tonic water, different flavors of tonic such as elderflower, cucumber, lemon, and Mediterranean, with the remainder composed of ginger beer, club soda, and other assorted non-tonic flavors, Sicilian lemonade, sparkling, grapefruit, etc. Roughly 70% of sales are off-premise, Grocery stores with 30% on-premise, restaurants, bars, etc. They typically sell in four packs of in four packs of cute little 6.8 ounce bottles for $5.99. Fever Tree was founded in 2004 by Charles Roll and Tim Rory Willow. Rory Low. Charles was a professional gin distiller. Tim was a beverage industry consultant. They wanted to create a product to ride the spirit premiumization trend. They were originally going to launch a premium gin a premium gin, but saw a better opportunity for a premium mixer. They thought, hey, if you're spending all this money on a premium spirit, then should you mix it with a premium mixer? Besides, when three-fourths of your drink is the mixer, don't you want to mix with something better than Schweppes out of a two-liter bottle, two bottle or soda gun? That's just cringe. And thus, Fever Tree was born. They were essentially the first mover in premium mixers. Ten years after founding, they came public. Fever Tree's DNA is spirits, not soda. They were built by partnering uh, with spirits companies to make the perfect gin and tonic. They co-market in TV ads with the likes of Grey Goose. They are distributed by spirits distribut distributors. They are consumed with alcohol. The co-founders uh, came from the spirits industry. The current US Fever Tree CEO is the former CEO of Belvedere Vodka. They are placed in the mixture ale, not the soda ale. They are all about the craft cocktail. Their slogan is, when three quarters of your drink is a mixer, mix with the best, not do the do, or whatever. 
in other words, it's a very different type of non-alcoholic beverage company that identifies more with spirits than soda. Fe Fever's strategy has been clear from the beginning. Sorry. Write the coattails of industry tents. Liquor premiumization and spirits and taking share from beer and wine via the cocktail structure uh, culture. Second, use only the best ingredients. Clean, all natural, nothing artificial. For example, they use cane sugar or fruit sugar as a sweetener rather than corn syrup or artificial sweeteners. They they score the world for the highest quality ingredients, uh, quinine from the Congo, lemons from Sicily, raspberries from Scotland, etc. How much of this how much of this is Lacroix style marketing puffery? I don't know. However, they come across as sincere and the stories they tell uh, they tell sound authentic. Third, Win the on-premise market first to establish consumer brand awareness, then move to the off-premise. If you're first to market, you can win the on-premise market. You naturally win the consumer off-premise due to the brand equity and brand recognition. This is a difficult strategy, but the right one to build a strong, durable consumer brand. Fourth, innovate. Fever Tree gets high marks for innovation. A steady flow of new mixers keep the conversation fresh and between reps and bartenders in on in the on-premise market, and it keeps consumers coming back into the mixer aisle to see what's new off-premise. Occasionally, something catches. For example, they launched sparkling grapefruit in 2020, and it is now over 10% of sales in the U.S. It's primarily used to make palomas, tequila, and grapefruit, and is a hit. Their elderflower tonic has also been a huge success. They have even had limited edition mixes such as Blood Orange. They create mixers around spirit and cocktail trends and also reduce and also to reduce their reliance on gin and tonic. It is a push to capture share of a growing premium mixer market and a widening assortment of flavors across different spirits. Marketing spend runs around 10% of sales. Fewer co-markets are a lot with spirit brands. For example, in the US, they co-branded with Bombay for gin and tonic um, tonics. They ran TV ads with Grey Goose for spritz options and ran a rum and cola reimagined campaign with Bacardi. Co-marketing with premium brand spirits helps a uh, spirit brands um, helps Fever build its own brand. Other forms of marketing are mainly focused on PR events such as the Kentucky Derby, Queen's Tennis, and pop-up bars such as the one they had in Bryant Park. This allows consumers to experience a variety of Fever Tree flavors and cocktails and ask questions of Fever Tree bartenders. They opened their first airport bar in May of this year in London, which has already served 60,000 cocktails, far exceeding their expectations. They are looking at opening additional airport bars. Industry background. Prior to Fever Tree, Schweppes dominated the market for tonic water with close to 100% share. Unfortunately, they rested a little too comfortably, as you would expect a 100-year-old company with 100% market share to do. Decade, decade after decade of no innovation and stale packaging, um, also, they suffered from fractured uh, ownership, making management and decision-making difficult. All this helps explain some of Fever's rapid market share gains out of the gate. Schweppes was the perfect company to disrupt. Fever is gaining extraordinary amounts of share across the globe due to an ill-prepared Schweppes. After Fever took off, it literally took Schweppes 10 years to get a premium tonic to market. There's still a lot of share for them to seed outside of the US where Fever has already won the market. Fever Tree has clearly struck a nerve with a consumer desperate for something better. All the KPIs say Fever Tree has created something special. They crush the competition on sell-through uh, sell rate, they take a market share at a rapid pace wherever they go, and they exhibit a tremendous pricing power, typically priced 100-200% to 200 over Schweppes. Every time they enter a market, they expand the mixer category. For example, the UK mixer market has tripled in size over the last eight years. They are a classic disruptor and have redefined the category. 
The key ingredients to winning this market are taste, image, distribution, and price. Fever appears to be winning on all counts except price. What is the addressable market at TAM for mixers? It's hard to say. I've seen a wide, vari- wide range of estimates and they vary widely. Also, the mixer category is growing fast as Fever Tree essentially created the category for premium mixes and is driving category growth. Here's what Fever Tree had in their 2021 presentation. UK retail makes a market at 330 million uh, fever value share, 45%. In the US, 1,530 million uh, fever market uh, fever value share, 5%. Europe, 677 million fever market share, 40%. Australia, 84, 40%. Canada, 161, 6%. Total, 207, 2,007. 182. Keep in mind, this is only the off-premise market, using Nielsen and IRI, IRI retail data. Assuming off-premise is 70% of the total, the TAM, including on-premise, would be close to £4 billion. Pounds. And then add in robust 2020, 2020 uh, to category growth. The mixer category grew 11% globally last year as fever drives trends, category growth, and redefining the category. The penetration rate of premium spirits far exceeds that of premium mixes. Lastly, I don't believe the numbers above include non-carbonated mixes such as a margarita mix and a Bloody Mary mix, expanding the category even further. Side note, they plan on entering non-carbonated mixers next year. Monk Stanley cites the total mixer market at $10 billion in their initial initiation piece from 2018. Regional Sales Overview Fever manages the company in four regions and reports sales as such. Region UK, 35.2%, Europe, 29%, uh, US, 26.8%, and ROW, 9%, rest of the world. UK. The UK is Fever's largest market at 35% of sales. Over the last five and ten years, sales have grown at CAGR of 40 per, at a CAGR of 40% and 34%, respectfully. In 2021, sales grew 15% and are up 6% in uh, the first half year of 2022, as they continue to recover from COVID bar restaurant lockdowns. UK sales grew 20, 12-fold from 2014 to 2018 as the brand caught on during a time when gin doubled its share of UK spirits from 10% to 20%. It now dominates the UK mixer market with 41% market share off-premise and 50% on-premise. Fever is now larger than Schweppes and 20x the size of the next largest premium mixer, Fentiments, with only 2% share. Retail sale is... A sell-through is 7x of that of other premium mixers. Operating out of only one bottling plant in the UK provides fever tremendous scale and efficiency. Given its already dominant market share in the UK, further significant gains are unlikely. While they continue to gain share and extend their dominant position on premise, overall growth will likely resemble that of the overall gin market. The market has shown signs of slowing this year as the economy weakens. Disposable income is under intense pressure due to the uh, due to high energy pr- prices and overall inflation. While fever tree consumers are often hardcore loyalists, they could begin to trade down. Consensus expectations are for 2% sales growth from 2020 to 2025. Uh, from 22 to 25, I'm sorry. Europe. Europe is Fever's second largest market at 29% of sales. Over the last 5 and 10 years, sales have grown at a CAGR of 27 and 26% respectfully. In 2021, constant currency sales grew 35% and are up 31% in the first half year of 2022. According to Nielsen, uh, Fever is the number one mixer brand in Europe. Management's, glo- started, management's stated goal is to grow their European business 2.5x from 2020 levels over the medium term. I take that as a, take that as a five years, so 2025, implying sales of 163 million versus 2022 2022 e sales of 160 million. 
US. The US fever tree's third largest uh, region at 27% of sales. The US is fever tree's third largest region, region at 27% of sales. I'm sorry. Over the last five and 10 years, sales have grown at a CAGR of 39% and 34% respectfully. In 2021, constant currency, currency sales grew 41%. The sales are only up uh, 11% in the first half year of 2022 due to, the, uh, due to supply chain issues, which have limited supply. According to management, underlying demand is stronger than current sales indicate and should improve in the second half year as they build inventory in the UK and ship to the US to fulfill strong demand. More on this later. The US market is fever's biggest opportunity. The US consumes 10x more in spirits than the UK. In the UK, premium mixes have grown to 45% of the mixer market versus only 10% in the US and 80% in Europe. Although Brits drink more gin than us Americans, so a comparable level of penetration may not be realistic. Further, we drink a lot more dark liquids, liquors, which pair with Coke. Still, according to Nielsen, Fever has already captured number one market share at retail in, in tonic and ginger beer in the US. Their rate of sale at retail is very high and far ahead of other brands in the US, encouraging retailers to give them more se shelf space. COVID accelerated momentum with retail sales almost doubling from 2019 to 2021. All KPIs point to a healthy, thriving brand in the US. Just uh, through the first half of 2022, they have increased total points of distribution by 33% via winning high-quality accounts such as, a, such as MGM, Marriott, and Four Seasons. Management stated a uh, goal. Management stated management's stated goal is to th grow the U.S. business 5x from 2020 levels over the medium term, implying sales of 20 uh, 295 million versus 2022 e sales of 94 5 million. Consensus is for 20 percent organic sales growth from 22 20 yeah from 10, 22 to 25, which seems about legit. Rest of the world. Rest of the world is Fever's fourth largest market at 9% of sales. Over the last five and 10 years, uh, sales have grown at a CAGR of 39 and 42% respectfully. In 2021, constant currency sales grow, grew 20% and are up 7% in the first half year of 2022. Uh, Australia and Canada are key markets where they are driving category growth. According to Nielsen, they are already the number one tonic brand in Canada. Stellar financial characteristics. Here are some numbers to salivate over. Sales growth. Um, uh, sales growth, 43% uh, in 13, 48 uh, in what, 49 in 14, 17 in 15, 72 in 16, 66 in 17, 38 in 18, uh, 9 in 19, minus 3 in 20, and... 23 and 21. EBITDA margin 80, uh, 28% in uh, 13, 28% in 14, 30% in 15, 34% in 16, 33% in 17, 32% in 18, 28 in 19 and 21 and 2020, and 19 and 2021. Tangible RIC, RIC cal adjusts a capital base for excess cash and accumulated intangible amortization. 78% uh, uh, 13, 264 and 14, 63 and 15, 110 and 16, 128 and 17, 112 and 18, 102 and 19, 94 and 2020 and 62 and 2021. As good as sales growth has been, 2020 and 2021 were hurt by on-premise COVID lockdowns and FX headwinds. In the UK, the on-premise market was shut down for half the year due to COVID restrictions. In the US, FX headwinds um, weighed on reported sales, which were reported up 33%, but were up 41% in constant currency. The 5 and 10-year sales CAGR are eye-opening. Eye uh, UK, 1 year 7%, 5 year 40%, 10 year 33%. Europe, 18%, 1 year um, 27% in 5 years and 26% in 10 years. US, 1 year 23%, 5 year 38%, 10 year 34%. Rest of the world, 20% in 1 year, 39% in 5 years and 41% in 10 years.
total one year 15 percent five years 34 percent 10 years 31 percent they see a lot of growth ahead and outline some of the existing opportunities below such as their intention to enter non-carbonated mixes in the u.s next year uh, agencies significant opportunities beyond carbonated mixers extending into non-carbonated cocktail mixes in the US with other markets to follow exploring premium adult soft drinks starting with the UK white space Asia and Latin, Latin America earlier stage focus on an establishing on trade in key city key cities long-term opportunity as Western drinking habits establish next wave um, including US Germany Italy Spain France Austria and Canada, a U.S. premium spirits category um, to 10x the size of the uh, over 10x the size of the U.K. A strong momentum in key European markets, driving category growth and premiumization in Australia and Canada. Stronghold including U.K. and Belgium transformed mixer category clear leadership position with significant price premium to mainstream mainstream brands, higher U.K. household penetration than one number. The number one UK beer brand. Hmm. Hmm. It's coming actually, so I like this. <laughs> uh, we'll have to take a deeper look, though. Further on, we go. As shown above, Fever generates returns on tangible capital of over 100% due to its asset light business model. CapEx is only 5 million. It owns no manufacturing plants or DCs. Raw materials, ingredients, labels, bottles, everything are shipped directly to the bottler. The finished product is then shipped to the distribution uh, distribu distributor who is responsible for getting it to bars, restaurants, and grocery stores. While this asset light model leads to lower costs and higher returns, it also leads to lower visibility and makes it more susceptible to cost pressures such as the ones they are currently experiencing. Working capital is the primary use of capital, which ran around 50% of sales pre-COVID and has run around 70% of sales during and post-COVID. Assessing the margin headwinds. The crux of the debate today is Fever's depressed margins. Fever Tree's mantra is 50% gross margins and 30% EBITDA margins. They lived up to that mantra prior to 2020, but then margins began to decline and haven't yet stopped. Gross margin... Um, in 2013 at 48 percent in 2017 at 53 percent in 2022 at 33 percent ebitda margin 2013 at 28 percent 2017 33 percent and um, 2022 in ten, at 10 percent as you can see we had eight years of pretty consistent margin performance before the wheels started to come off in 2020 the decline in gross margins accounts for essentially 100 percent of the decline in operating margins from 2019 to 2022 e uh, forever F fever's gross margin fell approximately 17 percentage points from 50.5 to 34 um, percent while its EBITDA margin fell about by about the same so we can narrow our focus on just the gross margin on as the source of the problem the issues impacting gross margins are us supply chain issues cost inflation Lack of scale in growth markets, pricing strategy, holding prices and growth markets despite high inflation. Using management commentary and company filings, the cumulative margin impact from these is um, fiscal year 19, 50% to fiscal year 33%, gross margin work. Uh, delayed ramp and limited glass availability in U.S. equals higher sea freight, sea freight inflation glass, but also general product and log logistics cost inflation. Morgan Stanley has done good work here. Provides a similar margin walk. They estimate the U.S. supply chain logistic issues account for 50% of the 1,700 basis points margins um, compression from 2019 to 2022, with 600 basis points coming from uh, transatlantic freight and another 250 presumably coming from inflation and diseconomics of scale. Management does not explicitly break out explicitly break out the margin impact from diseconomics of scale, but they do discuss it on their calls. 
It is presumably mixed in with logistic issues and cost inflation. Lock, lo, uh, lack of scale equals higher unit cost. Let's dig into each uh, of these to assess how much margin can be recovered. U.S. supply chain issues. Fever supply chain issues are confined uh, to the US, U.S. Fever currently makes only 40% of the U.S., of their U.S. finished product locally in the U.S. The remaining 60% is very expensive to source because it has been shipped from the U.K. The plan was to have 80% of U.S. production done locally by the end of this year. Unfortunately, they hit a production snags. They use, to bottle, they use two bottling plants in the U.S., one on each coast. The West Coast production line was commissioned in 2021 and the East Coast was commissioned in 2022. On the West Coast, they have had a difficult time sourcing glass bottles due to port congestion delays. Securing glass supply on the West Coast has led to hi uh, both higher glass cost, costs and higher freight costs, as well as incurring higher internal freight costs as they try to balance inventory between costs, coasts. They are working hard to secure glass supply in 2023 for both the East Coast and West Coast. Yes, there is a glass bottle shortage and prices are up a lot. On the last call, they said West Coast port congestion has eased and production there is running better. The bigger problem has been on the East Coast, where a labor shortage has slowed their production ramp. As a result, Fever is relying on their UK plant and shipping to the US. This has resulted in an extraordinarily high transportation cost and has left Fever vulnerable to skyrocketing transatlantic shipping rates, which are up another 50% another 50% this year, on top of the huge rise last year. According to the company, U.S. logistics costs were up 56% per case in 2021. They are up more this year. They are up more this year. The East Coast ramp is by far the biggest headwind to margins. Fortunately, these are visibly temporary costs that, could, that should resolve themselves over the next 6 to 12 months. We should see close to a full year of local bottling in the U.S. in 2023, which will dramatically reduce exposure to high sea freight and overall log logistic costs. Not only have the issues hurt margins, uh, they have also led to inventory shortages and had a meaningful impact on sales. Management has noted U.S. Demands, demand is far stronger than what current sales imply. They have recently been increasing uh, production in the UK plan to relieve their US inventory shortage. Given the high freight, f high transportation costs, they will probably lose money on these sales. However, it is it allows them to sustain momentum. With West Coast production now running more smoothly and East Coast inventory levels normalizing due to increased shipments from the UK, Fever is anticipating a strong fourth quarter. For modeling purposes, I assume they recover 80% of the U.S. logistics cost increases in 2023 as U.S. production ramps and U.K. to U.S. shipping declines. This leads to a 700 basis points gross margin improvement in 2023. I assume they ramp from 80% to 100% in 2024 and logistics costs improve further, adding another 180 basis points to gross margin in 2024. Okay, we're back. I had to take a little break. Uh, cost inflation. Cost inflation has two components. First, logistics and transportation, and second, product product costs. I assume some inflation will remain permanently, permanently, while some will prove transitory. Some will be offset with higher prices. My model assumes 50% recovery of cost inflation by 2025 via a combination of lower commodity costs and higher pricing. A lot of rides on European gas prices because they drive logistics and transportation costs as well as gas prices. The 50% increase in sea freight rates has been the primary driver of transportation cost inflation. It has been a huge headwind to margins. However, these costs will less, lessen dramatically as U.S. production ramps. Product cost inflation has been driven primarily by glass bottles, which are 30% of total product cost, uh, cost. Glass prices are primarily a function of gas prices, so they've 
had gas prices surcharges tied to gas prices. While improved port congestion has eased glass availability on the West Coast, globally glass availability across the industry has been restricted. In order to secure glass for the rest of the year, they had to agree to a double-digit price increase. They are currently negotiation negotiating for a 2023 glass supply. It is unlikely glass costs will decline next year and will probably increase. They also seen ingredient inflation, sugar and such. For modeling purposes, I have built in an additional 150 basis points headwind to gross margins in 2023 for inflation, partially offset by improving pricing, adding 50 basis points. In 2024, I assume they recapture 50% of the 2019 to 2022 cumulative inflation impact via a decline in commodity prices and improved pricing, adding 380 basis points to gross margin. This is a big assumption that has some risk to it. Lack of scale in the US. The, device, the diversification of volumes as we establish this network has temporarily reduced our economies of scale. As we increase volumes through this network, especially in the US, we will recapture economies of scale. Fiscal year um, 21 presentation, earnings presentation. UK operations are extremely efficient due to scale. They have 45% market share and run everything from one bottling plant, which accounts for 38% of total sales. So margins are high and profits are maximized. Contrast this to the 62% of sales outside the UK, which is spread across the globe and supported by six bottling sites and three canning sites. So 38% of sales in the UK. One bottling plant, 62% of sales in the rest of the world. Nine plants. Establishing this global network to serve um, the diversity of volumes has reduced economies of scale over the immediate term, intermediate term. As volumes continues, continue to grow, specifically in the US, scale will improve and with, other, with it margins. Onshoring local production in the US, Australia and elsewhere in the biggest challenge is the biggest challenge to margins. Bottle of fees are volume-based as are a lot of other purchase contracts. As the business scales, unit costs will come down and margins will lift. Pricing power. Fever Tree typically sells, uh, sells for 100-200% to 200% premium to the mass market brand. Schweppes, indicating huge pricing power and brand strength. However, in some cases, the gap between Schweppes and Fever has gotten too wide. Those who remember Marlboro Monday understand the risk of pushing pricing too far. In 2020, Fever reduced pricing by 15% in the US to help close the price gap between them and Schweppes. That was the first indicator that they may have pushed price too far. The second is this year. While most of Fever's peers are on their second round of price increases, Fever has been holding prices flat, leading some to believe their considerable pricing power is simply tapped out. While I think there is some truth to this, I also believe management is trying to prioritize growth and is hesitant to do anything that could disrupt, disrupt its momentum. It is winning over customers and taking share at a rapid clip and management doesn't want to disrupt that. Makes sense to me. Holding prices flat during a period of high inflation is a heavy cost in the near term. Longer term, either costs come down. They raise prices are, or they get squeezed. This is a good place to know that management thinks very long term, decades. So they are playing the long term game and don't mind suffering through a period of flat pricing if it means winning the US market long term. Fever's goal is to optimize price while maintaining an affordable premium product. Price strategy varies by market depending on growth. In mature markets, the UK, Fever is priced at 140% premium to Schweppes and is taking 8% pricing in 2022. In Europe, it's closer to 100%. In high growth, less mature markets such as the US, uh, the premium to Schweppes is closer to 250%. It is in this market that Fever has kept pricing flat as they try to drive adoption and narrow the price gap. 
They just completed an in-depth market by market analysis and plan to take pricing next year in certain markets. I've built in only 50 basis points for margin improvement from pricing next year, a fairly conservative, uh, conservative assumption in this environment. Summary on margin recovery. Adding up all the sources of margin recovery recovery gets up to gets us to 45.4% gross margin by 2024. 2022 it was 33.8. Can fever return to 50% gross margin margins and 30% EBITDA margins? I think it is very it is unlikely in the near midterm near medium term although 25% EBITDA margins seem reasonable by 2025 and they should move higher from there as as the business continues to scale my preference would be would actually be for them to drop their margin target and focus on winning the market bears argue that the margin degradation is structural we don't see a case for this but rather see most of the issues as transitory for over the next 1 to 2 years Cost headwinds, glass bottles, ocean freight should moderate as the economy slows and renormalize from the COVID dislocation and diseconomies of scale fade as they push more volume through the network. As we outlined above, we see a gross margins improving from 34% this year to 45% by 2024-25, resulting in EBITDA margins of 25 versus historical 30%, assuming 10% annual sales growth and 25% EBITDA margins. EPS will equal £72 by 2024 at the current price of £8.76 less one dollar sixty-five cents in net cash. Uh, one pound seven uh, sixty-five cents in net cash. Fever is trading at a um, PE X cash of nine point nine X normalized twenty-four EPS. Brand strength. Despite the margin headwinds, uh, there are many signs Fever's brand remains strong. Number one. Number one market share in the UK with forty-five percent value share and growing, and with 51% share on premise. They are bigger than Schweppes despite being 2.5x the price. They are 20x the size of the next largest premium mixer. Sell through sell through a 7x higher than other premium mixers. Second, grew 41% in constant currency in the US last year with total points of distribution increasing 33%. Already number one market share in tonic and ginger beer. Third, European sales are growing more than 30% and Fever is 6x the next largest premium brand. Fever has maintained huge pricing power globally. The importance, distribution and winning on-premise. Distribution to the on-premise market is an incredibly, incredibly important ingredient to success in this business. While the off-premise TAM is far bigger, the on-premise market heavily influences off-premise sales because it builds consumer awareness. The thought goes that if Fever can win the bartender on-premise, they win the customer off-premise. Building a brand this way is difficult and slow, but it is the right approach. Once Fever wins an account, it's pretty it's a pretty sticky business. The bartender has to have a good reason to switch. How do you get your product in tens of thousands of bars, restaurants, grocery stores across the globe? This takes an even this takes on even more importance in the US due to the size of the market and its complexities. Liquor laws, yes, I know Fever Tree isn't the liquor, just stay with me. Uh, in 2018, Fever signed a national distribution agreement with the largest spirits distributor in the US, Southern Glazes. Southern, ha Southern has a 35% share in wine and spirits distribution in the US, with a great portfolio of the largest and best spirit brands in the world, giving them a connection to almost every on-premise account in their territory. In on-premise, you're not selling to the customer, you're selling to the bartender. The bartender is the gatekeeper, and Southern's reps don't just distribute, they sell. Southern doesn't represent any other mixer distributors. Southern isn't going to distribute a competitor product because they are committed to Fever Tree and the largest 
and the second largest distributor in the US, RNDC, 15% share, isn't going to distribute an additional mixer because they already have an agreement with Q Fever's primary rival in the US. If this sounds like a great deal for the beverage company, keep in mind the distributor is getting a 30% margin. Common is industry knowledge. Spirits distribution is incredibly profitable. According to Wiki, Salma Glazes is the 11th largest private company in the US. And while Fever is a lower ticket for Southern, they make up for it in inventory turn. How does Fever win in on premise? Bartenders are always looking for better products to please their clientele. Clientele. They just want happy customers and a bigger check. Upselling the bartender from Schweppes out of a soda gun to Fever Tree out of a cute little single serve bottle is a big part of the sale. The pitch is exactly Fever, Tr- Fever Tree's motto. If three quarters of your drink is the mixer, mix with the best. For example, vodka is a flavorless, so the customer tastes only the tonic. Therefore, go with something better than Schweppes. While bartenders will serve you a gin and tonic with Schweppes out of the gun, no bartender feels good about that Good about that, due to the lack of fair sense and the lack of theater. Europe generally does not have soda guns, so drinks have always been served by the bottle. In the US, however, guns are per- pervasive. When a customer is served their cocktail and poured a tableside from the sassy little fever tree bottle, it creates theater and is a superior experience to schlopping on a G&T served from a gun with no presentation. And having the bottle displayed on the table is obviously a huge marketing tool that helps Fever grow brand awareness. This is what Southern does. They try to win the bartender over. If they can do that, Fever Tree becomes a growing, recurring revenue stream. While in on the premise market, the distributor is the sale, salesperson. In retail, there's no one to market the product. There's no one to market the product. The packaging does the marketing. If the consumer doesn't know any of the brands, they say they size you up by your price and your packaging. But if they can win you over on premise, it makes for much e- for a much easier sell in the grocery store. Build the brand on premise. Sell volume off premise. This is the brand building strategy of a spirits company. Fever Tree is building a brand like, like a spirits company. Another point worth making here is one of the big guys like Coke or Pepsi decided they wanted to enter the premium mixer market. They would have no natural distribution on premise. Yeah, they can actually distribute a premium mixer, but they don't have relationships with the bartenders and wouldn't know how to sell a mixer. Fever Tree, on the other hand, is partnering with the spirits companies, co-marketing with them, and has Southern representing them in an on in the on-premise. Coke and Pepsi have none of that. They don't have reps pitching new craft cocktails. Similarly, Schweppes is a, is a cheap, easy solution for the on-premise, but the reps aren't out talking to bartenders trying out new craft cocktails with new flavors. The national distributors have the scale to drive adoption at hundreds of thousands of on-premise accounts. Bars and restaurants are crucial to build the fun- built on the foundation foundation of fever trees brand equity there <coughs> i'm sorry <coughs> this relationship in combination with fever's co-marketing agreements with companies like diageo diageo highlights how fever tree behaves more like a spirits company than a typical consumer beverage business this consolidation and regulatory protection of the wholesale, wholesale tier protects the mode of scaled suppliers. In practice, September 20, 2021. Expanding into adjacent ad, adjacencies, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that. Fever recently bought, announced they intended to move into non-carbonated mixes in 2023. These would mainly be Margarita and Bloody Mary mix, but also bar essentials such as Grenadians and Bitters. The non-carbonated mixer market is larger than either tonic or ginger beer, and there's no clear leader. With Fever's brand equity, they have an excellent opportunity to grow into this adjacency.
they also recently announced they were testing expansion into adult soda. By placing some existing products that are sometimes consumed without alcohol in the adult soda ale of the grocery store, they will maintain the price premium and stay in the mixer ale, but expand the bottle size in keeping with traditional soda bottles and add them to the soda ale. This strategy makes me a bit nervous, thinking it could weaken their brand and image. But of course, the size of their TAM is multiples of the mixer market, so maybe it's worth testing. They are currently testing it in UK grocery stores. By adding SCUS to the soda ale, they have already secured shelf space equal to 5% increase. Valuation. With earnings temporarily... Um, depressed any valuation metric on current or even 2023 numbers is meaningless let's start by looking at EV to sales and then move to valuation on anticipated normalized earnings as you can see EV to sales NTM is super depressed at 2.25x its lowest level by far since going public before that I would say it was at an average of 7 to eight. In my opinion, there's a ton of strategic value here for someone with global distribution like the IGO. Consider that Coke took a stake in Monster, somewhat similar to Fever in returns, growth, and its niche niche beverage profile at 5x sales. Here are a few other private company market comps of niche beverages that are worth considering. Body Armor, Monster, Rockstar, Bay, Gatorade, and Vitamin Water. All acquired by either Coke, Pepsi, or Dr. Pepper. Um, EV2 sales from uh, 3.5x to 7.4x. So purely on... So purely on mark, private market comps using EV2 sales has more than 2x upside and fever's high margins argue for an above average EVS multiple. A large acquirer with a global supply chain and global distribution could solve many, if not all, of fever's current issues. Most sell-side analysts actually comp fever to spirits companies rather than soda companies. The private market values in spirits are even higher at sex approximately 6x EVS. It's worth spending a minute uh, digressing here on Monster. At the time Coke bought their stake in Monster 2024, uh, in 2014, um, they were a distant second to Red Bull in, be in a beverage niche some thought fetish. Today, Monster is the number one stock in total shareholder return over the past 20 years with a total return of 170%. It is up over 4x since partnering with Coke. The day they reported the Coke distribution and equity ownership deal, the stock was up 38% and never looked back. This speaks to the opportunity Fever has in partnering with a global beverage company to accelerate distribution. The big difference in distribution is Fever needs someone that can sell into on-premise a connection with the bartenders. That would be a liquor company, and it would have to be a company that has a brand in almost every spirit category because Fever would be abandoning co-marketing rela relationships uh, with all other liquor companies. Diageo has 48% share in gin and has a portfolio of Brands across spirit types seems like a good fit. Now let's look at a, a normalized earnings and go, get and get to a value on PE. I start by modeling out sales uh, by region for 2022, 2024 uh, to 2024. They are roughly in line with consensus. As you can see, estimates below, which uh, result in a 10% sales CAGR to 2024. <laughs> Using the margin anal analysis from earlier, our model gross margins returning to 45.4% uh, by 2024 and EBITDA margins of 24.7%. Of, of While these margins are far higher than today's level, they are conservative relative to the eight years prior to COVID. It somewhat splits the difference. These assumptions get us to £72 uh, in 2024 EPS as shown below. Sense. 
X Cash Fever is trading at a PE of 9.9x. These normalized EPS. Uh, these normalized EPS. Public market comps are tricky because, but considering the that beverage, natural beverage Lacroix trades trades at 50% higher on EVS and doesn't have near the margin profile of Fever. Fever is more comparable to Monster, which has a similar history of high growth re and returns. It trades at 39x 2022 e earnings and 8.3 EVS. I assume a fair multiple is in the low 20s. 23x 24 normalized earnings plus one pound uh, 65 in net cash gets me to an estimated value of 18 pounds 21 or upside of 108 percent to 2024. Competitive advantages. First mover in the off premise. In the off-premise, Fevertree being first to market was an undeniable advantage. Many customers are now loyal Fevertree customers and they have to have a reason to switch. If you are a Fevertree customer, it's hard to find a reason to switch other than to downgrade for budgetary reasons. And shelf space is limited. Fever provides the retailer with fast inventory turn and strong margins, hard for newcomer to compete with. Distribution. U.S. distribution is highly concentrated with Southern Glazers and RNDC having a combined 50% market share. Glazers carries Fever and RNDC carries Fever's largest competitor, Q. And neither is interested in bringing in a second premium mixer. Brand. All the KPIs outlined in this report, sales growth, price premium, sell through rate versus competitors, etc. point to a significant brand equity. The hard work Fever has put into establishing an on-premise presence has certainly helped build the brand. Risks. Consumer spending. The economy is obviously weakened, a weakening which poses trade-down risk. Longer term, maybe we are at the end of an era of conspicuous consumption and entering an era of repression. This is a macro risk. Brand versus fad. I fully acknowledge Fever Tree. It could be some decade long fad, and the investment gods are playing a sick joke on me. I remind I am reminded of all the flavored seltzers that came to market at price premiums and are now in the same low price bin. If things turn out south, I believe the stock price is supported by strong strategic value. Competition. Competitors are Schweppes, the largest mass market brand, Q, the second largest premium mixer brand to Fever, and tons of small competitors. Every major grocery chain now has their own private label tonic, so I don't want to understand the competition. While there's tons of competition in the space, we believe Fever's first mover advantage, distribution, and brand equity create a sizable barrier to, uh, to entry. Bartenders need a reason to switch, and it's hard to find one, especially if they're already using Southern for their spirit needs. Q is Fever's primary competitor in the US. They are in the number one, they're in the same number of stores today. However, Fever's sales per store is more than double Q's at 250k versus 100k. Fever has said they took considerable share from Q during COVID and that their sell-through is 60 to 90% greater in stores where they have the same number of SQs, SKUs. Also, Q is 50% club soda and 25% ginger beer. There's room for both brands, Witness, Red Bull, and Monster. Pricing. Relative to other food categories, a Fever sells for a huge premium to the mass market brand. It would, be, it would be hard to find a category in the grocery store that exhibits such a widespread between premium and mass. Fever's pricing power may be tapped out. Alternatives. The explosive growth in legalized marijuana could take share from alcohol. While they certainly aren't mutually exclusive, a pot provides consumers an alternative to get fucked up. <laughs> My favorite Fever Tree cocktails. Fever Tree, Mediterranean Tonic, and Hendrix Gin Fresh Squeezed Lime Wedge. Fever Tree, Elderflower Tonic, and Impressed 1908 Gin Lime Wedge Garnish. And Fever Tree, Sparkling Grapefruit, and Don Julio Blanco Tequila. Awesome. 
Um, this is not recommendation. Like I said earlier too, he, he does describe this as well. I do not hold a position with the issue such as employment, re- directorship or consultancy. I and or others I advise hold the material investment in the issue is security. I do not advise this. Uh, catalyst. It's not that I don't advise it. It's just not recommendation. That's what I do. Catalyst. Uh, margin recovery as US production ramps inflation cools. Uh, I opened up on Guru Focus Fever Theory. It's currently at a price of $13.71. And market cap $166 billion, um, uh, $1 billion, one billion 66, uh, 66. Uh, enterprise value $1 billion 50. And PE at 32, PB at 5.59. 5, Guru Focus says it's undervalued significantly as well, but that's not trust on that algorithm uh cash to debt 37 percent debt to equity 0.01 mm, i don't have a lot of that that's awesome um ev to free cash flow 34 percent interesting company thank you very much for tuning in um i will actually take a look at this further because i actually find it Quite interesting. Um, I like this company so far. Uh, tune in next time. Thank you very much.